Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's securityboulevard.com webinar. We're excited that you've joined us. We have a great, really interesting topic, very timely. Securing medical apps in the age of COVID-19, how to close security gaps and meet accelerated demand. The uh, webinar today is uh, hosted and sponsored by InterTrust Technologies. My name is Mitch Ashley. I'll serve as your host and moderator. A few housekeeping items. We are recording the webinar. So the great news is you can sit back, listen to our speakers today. After you take detailed notes, you can always go back and review the recording. All, all participants will receive an email with a, a link to the recording, as well as a uh, copy of our slides. So enjoy the talk today. We're also giving away four Amazon $25 gift cards at the end of the webinar. So please stick around and uh, find out if you're one of our lucky winners. Our two speakers today really enjoy questions. They're, they're looking forward to interacting with the audience. So please, enter any questions that you have into the questions tab of the GoToWebinar software. We'll be getting to those a little bit later in the hour, but anytime that you have a question, just pop those in and we'll be happy to uh, get to them. So let's move on to our topic, securing medical apps in the age of COVID-19, how to close security gaps and meet accelerated demand. It's my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers for today. First is Deb David Mayer, who is CTO and EVP with InterTrust Technologies. Second also is Andrew Snyder, Technical Solutions Director with InterTrust Technologies. Uh, David, why don't you start to give us a little bit of more of an introduction, tell us a little bit about yourself and we can have Andrew uh, do the same. Sure. Um... Uh, so I've been the CTO at InterTrust for about 20 years uh, and um, specializing in secure distributed systems, which is uh, mainly what uh, InterTrust uh, focuses uh, its technology efforts on. And uh, before that, I was um, at Bell Labs for about 18 years as head of the Secure Systems Research Department and various other departments at, uh, at Bell Labs working with the National Security Agency and uh, uh, Department of Defense on various classified systems. And I uh, played uh, the role of both attacker on systems and uh, defender. And uh, so I'll be taking the sort of the, the systems perspective here uh, in, in our commentary today. Andrew? Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, thanks, Mitch. Uh, my name is Andrew Snyder. Uh, I'm in the sales department here, uh, but come from a technical background. Uh, I've been working in uh, IT and software for about the last 15 years, uh, often with uh, enterprise mobility and protection. Uh, and I tend to work with both our largest uh, banking customers as well as the large uh, healthcare and medical device application companies uh, that we're currently working with. Uh, but I'm going to be leading the conversation today. But um, we're really glad that you're here. Uh, I will reiterate what Mitch said um, when we began is we've got a series of, uh, of information that we're gonna walk through, but we're really, really curious to hear why you're here and perhaps what you would like to learn. So um, please do put questions in the, in the box. We're gonna have plenty of time at the end um, to discuss those. Uh, and we're just looking forward to having a, a good conversation for today. So when, when I was thinking about this, uh, this webinar um, and the research project behind it, uh, as you may have seen, I think it's available in, in the, uh, the, the interface here as well as we'll deliver it at the end, is we created this research report of the medical app landscape um, a, a long time ago. Um, and then the world fell over with COVID. Um, and needless to say, uh, it has become incredibly important uh, and has changed the medical app landscape uh, the, the current world that we live in here in December of 2020. Um, it, 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 we all, since we all live the same reality, there's no way to say that this hasn't changed everything. And so what we do really seems to be, we, we, we kind of feel like we're in the right place at the right time. As David said, we, the InterTrust has been around for 30 years. We've been building trusted data systems for a very long time. Um, and we are very glad to be able to apply our expertise into this, it's always been a very important place, but now it is a critically important place. Um, and so we're just excited to talk through these different things. So with the dramatically increased patient usage and provider adoption of medical apps, this has dramatically increased the risk, right? Your attack vectors are broader. 
Uh, the apps are the interface between healthcare organizations, patients, their data, and a connected world. Um, this is the new endpoint. It's not necessarily someone jumping in a car and going to the store. It's the convenience of digital, and yet you have incredibly important information that's being held in these applications. And generally speaking, we're talking about mobile medical today, but there's certainly some certain applications on desktop and in cloud and things like that. Also things that we can cover with our technology, but not something we're going to focus on today. So since these are the new endpoint and they have such an increased attack surface, we have this tension between the need to develop quickly, get products to market, help our customers or our patients with the need to do things well and securely. And so there's, there's this tension. There, there's a variety of statistics in this uh, report as well as what we'll talk about today. But 85% of healthcare organizations acknowledge that a security breach would compromise patient care. And yet 37% of those same organizations they sacrifice mobile security to get the job done quickly or good enough. They, we call this sort of ticking the box. They think they need some security, they tick a box to get that security and they move on. Problem is, usually that level of security is not sufficient. And so we're gonna to talk today about closing those sorts of gaps, um, generally in mobile applications. But again, as sort of David said earlier, it's also in the whole system. Um, if you have, a chink in your armor, so to speak, um, those can be exploited. Okay, so if we believe that these applications hold extremely valuable and sensitive data, this is not just patient data, it's also demographic data, it's medical data, it's often finance data because you can use these applications to purchase things or um, uh, get things from the pharmacy. Finally, the last thing I want to highlight, and perhaps this is some of you that are on this call, is a lot of times in the medical app space, the med tech space, your business is your intellectual property. Your business is the algorithm that does some very interesting thing that is unique to you. If that IP or algorithm gets away from you, your business could be over. It could just you wouldn't have a competitive advantage. And so the need to protect against that possibility is very high. And again, you've got to balance that security with speed, but you need to, this is something where you really need to do a good job. So of course, there's a large number of medical apps. Of course, they're increasing every year, um, but this is something where kind of a deep breath and what you need to do to move forward is, is really important. So when we looked at the universe of medical apps, there's a lot, and there's several different categories. We picked four. We picked four categories to focus on. And we didn't choose consumer health and fitness because they didn't quite fit in sort of some of the points that we were trying to make in the importance of protecting data. And so these are the categories that we picked. And so just to define some terms, Health commerce is pharmacies and medical device companies that do things like sell products and refill prescriptions online. I certainly have a number of applications on my phone where I can push a button and then walk into a store and pick something up or have it delivered to my home. Medical device apps are really interesting. We're gonna talk more about this in a specific use case later, but this is an app that talks to a device that is somehow connected to your body or is delivering medicine or processing really valuable data for you. This could be uh, sensor data. This could be information that's being used to create a therapy or even things like delivery of insulin. If you've got an insulin pump and you've got some glucose numbers, very important data, incredibly important to protect. Now, this third one for me personally, I was never a big fan of telemedicine. Um, even into 2020, but it's been around for a while. This is one of those cases where usage went from some relatively small number to some enormously gigantic number with the rise of COVID. Um, this telemedicine and patient engagement uh, category uses things like video, remote monitoring, and other technologies to treat patients remotely. I actually just did one yesterday. 
as well as creates the patient engagement of the scheduling and the administrative aspects. This is all incredibly important data for me personally and for the users of whatever service that I'm a part of. A breach or a break in this system is, how should we say, problematic. Um, and then finally, COVID tracking apps. This wasn't even a category, and now it's potentially the most important category because the world has to conquer this disease and we need as much data as possible and the confidence that we can move forward based on being able to trust the data. So again, no surprises here. There's lots of apps, dramatic growth. And yet, as we'll see in the next slide, there still are circumstances where security becomes kind of a checkbox and not a dedicated effort to do a good job uh, with your with your applications. And in just a little bit after this slide, we're going to run a poll. But I want to talk about this because there's there's some big numbers here and there's some some terms that I want to sort of talk about. But if you call them M Health, if you call them MedTech, suffice it to say, if if you took any slice of applications out there, there would always be vulnerabilities. Some of these are particularly important. We classify these as high severity vulnerabilities. And many apps have one or more. Now, after we analyze all these apps, we're trying to determine risk because what we found is our customers, they know they need security. Everybody knows they need security, but they have to balance that security with the risk and the consequences of exploit. And certainly in the med tech and health space, those consequences can be significant. Okay, so we looked at these, we looked at the different categories. There were certain categories that had higher vulnerabilities. Um, and so, you know, the telemedicine actually had the highest, which of course is the, the, the ramp that has potentially grown the most. And then health commerce apps were about 80% and medical device apps were, were much lower. So clearly much more attention had been paid to those medical device apps. And then the COVID apps actually had the least number of high severity vulnerabilities, but they're also probably the newest, which means they might be the best, well, you know, the, the best built applications. And they also probably aren't as complex because almost by definition, they were rushed to market. Now, that's one area of high severity vulnerabilities. Let's not do that. Let's not have vulnerabilities if we can avoid it. Cryptographic problems are a real challenge. And I'm going to kind of speak in general terms and get into more specifics a little bit later. But a cryptographic problem, a cryptographic key is a key. If you have the key, you can get the data. And so if you have, or if you fail cryptographic tests, this can be significantly bad, right? And so what does that mean? How, how do you fail a cryptographic test? That means you expose an encryption key. It can be found, it can be read, and it can be used. You can poorly implement cryptographic algorithms. Maybe you use an insufficient key size that's too short or it's, it's improperly formatted. Or you don't encrypt the communications. And so the key can be lifted and altered. Now, I like to pick on Android because I'm a diehard iOS user. But on Android, 80% of the applications didn't do SSL pinning. Now, you maybe perhaps you haven't heard of SSL pinning, but SSL pinning encrypts the pipe between the app and the web service. And so if you can falsify that, your, your app can either talk to a, a, a foreign web service or a rogue app can talk to your web service. And either way, you can do bad data or you can foul the data up. Um, this is something that should be done, should be done well and is fairly straightforward. One of the core reasons that we found in both this analysis and just our understanding with different customers is many application developers are application developers. They are not security architects. They are not security experts. They perhaps know or have the best of intentions, but if you're not, this is one of those domains where you are either an expert or you leave it in the hands of the experts. Um, and so there are at times challenges. And, and I mentioned Android and um, iOS has some similar challenges. Um, there's a function in iOS called an ATS which is a networking feature where it tries to encourage you to use the most secure protocols. And yet many didn't implement that particularly well. Now, 
certainly listening to a conversation like this, highlighting the areas for threat or risk is, is part of it. But the good news is, is many of these, the vast majority of these can be mitigated or remediated using in-app protection. Now, in-app protection is a variety of methodologies to make sure and close the gaps on your applications or your data set so that you don't have as high a risk or a, a, a level of worry about your application. So we sort of frame this as it's, it's fairly easy to do things not particularly well. And then there are ways that you can protect things well so that you can have confidence moving forward. And so um, before we move on any farther, um, I know that Mitch wanted to put up a poll because we'd love to know a little bit more about the audience so that in the continuing slides, we can be a little bit more precise of, of how we tell stories. Um, as we get to that, uh, Dave, if there's anything that you wanted to add on, on what we cover, covered up to this point, feel free or we can do that as we talk about the poll results. Well, uh, yeah, I just want to emphasize that uh, you've done a very good job of presenting the expansion of, uh, as you call it, the attack service, uh, just because there are a lot more uh, uh, medical health uh, uh, apps out there and we're using them a lot more often. Uh, but uh, also I want to remind people from a system point of view, a lot of these apps are used to access other parts of a, uh, a healthcare system, uh, specifically healthcare records and, and um, uh, telemedicine and, and those kinds of things. So you really need to look at these things from a system point of view. So as an example, the, the one that you just gave, uh, in many cases, you're using an app to access uh, some other uh, uh, system, such as your medical records, and uh, you're, you think you're using encryption in order to do that, and if your encryption isn't implemented uh, properly, then you're going to uh, uh, not really just compromise your local app, but you're going to compromise uh, uh, potentially access to a patient system, your own patient information. If you're a healthcare provider and you're remotely accessing, you're going to be uh, exposing other people to, uh, to risks. So from a system point of view, um, you need to consider how all these things, all these different apps are, are working together uh, and how as a system attacking on uh, an endpoint actually affects uh, you know, uh, the system as a whole. Yeah, thanks. Why don't we go ahead and just, Mitch, jump it in. So we go ahead and launch our poll, just get some uh, feedback from the audience. Super easy uh, a question to answer. Just click and give us your feedback. What is your biggest app security challenge? Did your buy in, inadequate resources, complying with regulations, Legacy applications, time. So if we had some music, uh, Jeopardy music, I'd play it right now, but <laughs> if we want to take a few minutes to can have our audience uh, jump in and give us your thoughts, what some of the things you're dealing with. I would imagine for some of us, we might check multiple of these. Uh, and Mitch, <laughs> Mitch, if you had given me enough warning time, I could have prepared some Jeopardy music. Um, oh, darn, or, well, next time I know. Sung, <laughs> sung a Christmas carol or something like that. But there you go. We might have to just whistle it here, and I won't. I won't put you on the spot asking me to do that. I appreciate. We've got really good participation here. Um, I want to do just a quick countdown. We'll close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. All right. Let's share some results there. Love to have you both uh, jump in with your thoughts on the results. Okay. I, I love polls because it's such a snap response. What, what my first glance, and I'll certainly let Dave opine, I love that leadership buy-in is not a priority, which means leadership's a, leadership has already bought in, right? They get it. Um, you know, a leader, a leader saying, no, we don't need security on these very important apps, you know, like that, that you know, you're not a leader or you're not in that job anymore kind of thing. Um, legacy applications, I can make an assumption on what that is. You know, that was the top result. Meaning, <laughs> meaning you've deployed software and you need to retrofit it, but that's hard and it it's, um, can be a challenge. We've got, what, 20 years of software that's been deployed, more than that for sure. 
of 10 years of mobile applications that have been built. Um, regulations. Yeah, regulations can be a challenge working with the FDA, getting CE marks, getting approval for being, you know, getting launched around the world. Um, the nice, at least on that particular point, um, and I'm not an expert, believe it or not, on the FDA because it's a little inscrutable working with them at times, but certainly FDA continues to up its requirements for cybersecurity for medical devices and apps that touch medical devices. Um, we have worked with a number of companies successfully. Uh, we have every reason to believe that we continue to work with companies in working with those regulatory bodies. Um, and that's the kind of partnership we tend to have with our customers. It's not a security is not a one time event. It's a it's a process. It's a relationship. Sometimes it's, it feels a little cat and mouse because the hackers or the people who try to alter applications are very creative. But that's um that's good to see. Dave, what what do you think about the responses here? Uh, so I think that complying with uh, regulations is not a surprise. I think people are more aware of uh, uh, of compliance, and um, I would remind people that. HIPAA uh, is often uh, thought of as, as being a, a big compliance issue for uh, uh, healthcare apps. But uh, another one that has uh, uh, arisen on the scene over the past few years and is increasing is GDPR, because you're going to be dealing with a lot of privacy issues. And one of those, uh, one of the requirements for GDPR is when you're designing your systems is uh, security and privacy by design. And uh, we'll be talking about how you can accomplish that today. But um, you're not going to just see it in Europe with GDPR. You're going to see it in California, for example, has uh, a, a new set of regulations that are kind of mirror the, the requirements from GDPR. So, uh, and, and people are aware of that. So that's a, it's a really big one. Legacy applications, I think is, a, is a, an important uh, aspect uh, to deal with. And it is hard, uh, but it also uh, tells you that uh, if you do your new applications with security by design, the legacy issues will be fixable and, and a little bit easier. But uh, also I think uh, you're gonna, probably be reissuing a number of some of, uh, versions of some of those applications and having a tool set that is a little easier to use uh, regarding uh, uh, retrofitting security and privacy. Uh, that's going to be an important aspect of, uh, of uh, what we'll talk about as well. Uh, the tool sets for recompiling and, and, and uh, updating uh, updating uh, applications uh, wherever they are, whether they're on servers or you know, their web apps or, or uh, mobile apps. I'm uh, glad you mentioned uh, uh, GDPR and CCPA, <clears throat> the whole privacy side, really is a part of the security ecosystem we have to address. Looking forward to hearing about them, more about that, gentlemen. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we'll talk, I'll, I'll dive into some more specifics as we go forward. Let's see if I can get my computer to work right. There we go. So, so what does this mean, right? First of all, I, I do take a look at this graphic. So th this is a good example of a data flow of a relatively straightforward use case. Sensor to reader to app to desktop to cloud, maybe to pump or brain stimulator or pacemaker. All of this is, again, this is what I do. All of this is really cool, but to, to protect it, to secure it, over these different protocols, over these different networks, is really, really critical. Now, what does this mean? It means you need to care a lot about the things that are most important, and certainly those are things like data theft and privacy. People really don't like having their information hacked, sold, and a variety of, of you know, unexpected things done. They tend to turn on companies that do that. The internet is so fast and so pervasive that there's kind of no place to hide. And so the need to proactively aim to protect this to the state of the art is really, really critical. Um, Dave, of course, mentioned HIPAA, regulatory violations, fines, different GOs requiring different requirements. It it's, can be a, a challenge to both understand them all and protect against them. Suffice it to say, sort of checkbox security or you know, taking the default is not going to get you there. Um, 
proprietary algorithms, I talked about this a little bit um, earlier in the call, those algorithms are gold. Like if you have a great idea and you can patent it and protect it from your competitors, you also have to protect it from those that might want to alter it, steal it, or bring your business down by getting their hands on it. Um, the risks that we help protect against are not necessarily uniquely technical. They are also business risk, operational disruption. If you're publicly traded, having a hack publicized can hurt the value of your company. Um, this is part of, this is how security has gone from something that the guys in engineering worry about to something that the businesses worry about. And so for your organization and the ability to deal with patient health risk and what would happen if someone hacks our mobile application, that's a that's a C-level question. And so we, again, this is what we do. That is a conversation we're very comfortable with. Um, and I think Dave and I probably have, both have some uh, horror stories or, 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 you know, experience from the past where maybe something really creative happened in the marketplace that was unexpected and how we remediated that and moved forward with that customer, or we learned something about the technology. Uh, Dave's background in systems design often means that he finds or is privy to new ways to break into things. Uh, we're going to talk about those in a little bit, but uh, there is a lot to focus on. It does boil down to this is important and you need to work with a firm that this is what they do and walk your way through the process. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about the solutions that we offer that apply to this space directly, but it is a, uh, it is a need that needs resolution. And it's, we're, we're definitely past the point where we could ignore the need to do this well. Okay, so we are going to have ask one more, one more poll after this slide. That's a little more technical, so get ready. <laughs> but so the healthcare threat trends are generally, they're all going up. They're happening more faster. So more breaches, more ransomware, more threats against your business or your customers or your patients because there's money involved, because there's a way to exploit something for gain. Um, this is continuing proof points that we found in our research, but this makes logical sense. Everybody understands that this is something that happens. And so just as a way to encourage folks to reach out, to talk to those that you trust, to find out, well, how do we solve this problem? And how can you help me with part of this problem um, is, is a space that should be part of the conversation. And certainly one of the reasons we're here is we think we have excellent answers in the endpoint on the mobile apps, on the desktop apps, things like that. But then people like Dave, they really take an entire system view of how to protect the entire universe of data in this, potentially for global applications. It's not really relevant specifically for this conversation, but we have an, an entire division that's focused on some of this. Um, Dave, did you want to talk at all about that, or maybe we pick that up a little bit later? Yeah, let's pick it up a little bit later. I think uh, I think I'm interested in getting to the solutions part but, and and, and okay. how we get to the solutions. Sure. So let's do that. Um, let's do that second poll. Great. We'll get that launched right now. Is white box cryptography a part of your software protection strategy? That's my security system firing off in the background if you hear my dogs barking. <laughs> yes, no, or what is white box cryptography? I guess you could take that as sort of a, a funny response, or maybe you don't know what it is. Might one of you say a little bit about what white box cryptography is? Well, we'll wait, we'll wait for the answers to the questions. And I uh okay. don't want to give it away. <laughs> no, no, no. And I, I actually just had the poll drop behind, so I'm not sure if it can be surfaced again, but you know, I'm sure oh. it'll be the answers when it comes up. That's probably one of the many windows on our systems. We're getting good responses too. Lots of folks are jumping in. We'll give it a few more seconds here. Um, Jeopardy music is playing. It's just in my head. So sorry you all can't hear it, but. Uh, <laughs> it's, oh, it's I see the poll now. Okay. Here we go. Is white box cryptography a part of your software protection strategy? Great. Well, it looks like 
let's wrap it up here. Three, two, one. Okay, great. How about show some results there? Looks like uh, 28% yes, 28% no. 44%, what is it? Okay. Interesting. So that, that's great. I, I, I love that. I, and I'm curious if we have some customers on the line just to know that they're listening of what's kind of the state of the art with what we're doing. Um, I'm going to define white box in about, well, we'll just do it right now. So and Dave will give you a very precise technical answer, but in short, it's a way to do crypto in software only without dependence on, on backend hardware. And when I say backend hardware, that means on a mobile device, a, a key store or um, a secure enclave, something like that in a mobile device so that that's where the keys get processed. That's where the crypto occurs. Whitebox uses those same algorithms, those same ciphers, but it puts it in a library inside your application. And those libraries and those keys are protected against attack. Um, just with regard to that one comment, Dave, do you want to um, talk a little bit more now or when we bring up a security key box in a little bit? Let, let, let me uh, add to that a little bit. So white box uh, cryptography is best uh, defined actually from the point of view of the attacker. Um, the attacker in a black box model uh, can um, see um, plain text go in, that is the unencrypted information go into the crypto, uh, crypto algorithm and then uh, can't see what's going on with that plain text and then it can see the results coming out. So it's going into a black box, coming out from the black box. In the case of uh, white box cryptography, you're considering a model whereby the attacker can see some aspects of what's going in, on inside that box. And it might be something very, very simple, like it can see uh, how much power is being used by the microprocessor when certain, uh, during uh, different times when the cryptography is executed. And uh, believe it or not, it's quite possible to extract the key just by understanding what's happening to the power uh, uh, drawn by the microprocessor in some different kinds of crypto algorithms or, or implementations of crypto algorithms. Just one, literally one lead on the microprocessor or in many cases you can get that from another app that uh, that's uh, executing on the same device. So, and by the way, what I just described is something that we'll talk about later called uh, side channel attacks. But in any case, uh, the idea is that uh, a, an intruder or a hacker is going to be able to get inside the execution of the algorithm and extract a certain amount of information and therefore uh, be able to get the key. And so what you wanna do is have an implementation of cryptography uh, the cryptographic alg algorithm that is resistant against that or makes the assumption that the attacker is going to be right there with you and be able to see what's going on and so you have to obfuscate uh, what's going on uh, so that they can't gain that information. Thank you. Like I said, that was a much better description, uh, but the, you know, the, the, the hacker being right there with you um, and assume, and I'll just jump here, so that's a risk you need to protect against. Someone has your code, they're walking through it, they can see everything as if it were wiped, as if it were clear. Um, so let's talk about risks, specific technical risks. So one of them is we talked about already, this innovation and expensive security. This is the, I wanna go fast, I wanna deploy quickly, but I wanna balance that against my security team says I need three weeks of testing or, or, or whatever it is. There's that balance. There's also the creative user. And I know this from direct experience in that not all hackers are malicious, trying to break it, steal it, burn it down or exploit it. Some people are moms or dads that are highly technical, that have family members or children with a particular ailment that see a way to alter information so that things behave differently. This could be, again, medical device apps. Insulin comes up often because it's so popular out in the marketplace these days. But I wanna do better in keeping my family member or child healthy. It's still hacking. It's still altering what was delivered, but it's just a different type of person that might be altering what you're doing. So 
of all the different types of hacking attacks, and, and, and Dave just mentioned a, a really technical one called side channel attacks. Um, it all starts with reverse engineering, meaning you want to break something open, see what it does, and try to understand it, and then try to see if you can do have it do something else. That's tampering, changing what it is to do something else. Um, also, it's just since it's at the top, um, on mobile devices, as you probably know, you can jailbreak it or root it, which means you become an admin on the device, which means you can do everything, which means all the built-in device protections are gone. Just they don't exist anymore because a root level user can do anything. And so this is where you get into this. You need solutions that can survive in a zero trust environment. You assume the device is broken. You assume the hacker is right next to you and you build solutions that continue to resist in that world. And that's what we do. And so with that as a mindset, blocking things like application cloning, where someone can take your app, skin it, and upload it as their app instead of your app. Harvesting credentials, meaning somehow capturing some data and piping it off somewhere else, or somehow taking that data, stealing that data, and doing something with it. Maybe people just like to serve ads or um, do malware injection. They want to inject something into your code, also tampering, but it does something else. Maybe it mines Bitcoin on your phone, or uh, excuse me, Bitcoin on your phone. Now, we're going to talk about keys. We're going to basically talk about keys almost until the rest of the, this talk, but getting the key means you get in the door. It's not breaking the key, it's finding the key. So like what Dave was saying with Whitebox is if you can find the key, you are the user, you do have access. And so encrypting keys, hiding keys, so that they're not reusable and exploitable is fundamental to a good security posture. And so here's how you hack an app. Again, I like to pick on Android, but this can be done for iOS as well. Um, and these numbered steps are, are the flow, of course. Everything is legitimate up until we get to step four. Um, it's easy to download an application. APK files are just the file format for Android. You can unpack those with a push of a button and see all that well-written code that your teams have written. Um, it's trivial to reverse engineer and alter that code and just test it with the various applications that are out there that do static and dynamic analysis. If you can find a way to tamper with the code to your benefit, whatever that benefit might be, you can just recompile the application and upload it into an app store. <laughs> this is fundamentally bad, right? This is what you don't want to have happen. And so since you can't stop number one or number two or number three, the key is in steps four and five where the reverse engineered code is so difficult to understand, it can't be reverse engineered or it's incredibly difficult to reverse engineer. It also can't be repackaged and say touch other services like web services, because if it's known to be different, then you can have checks to check for that difference and not allow it if different, right? Doing tamper resistance. Um, and blocking these sorts of exploits that happen all over the world where your code is somehow living inside of someone else's code to your detriment. Um, this is where people can see your well-written algorithm and use it for their own use. Um, but at least in terms of the, the jargon in this space, this is static analysis, dynamic analysis, um, seeing whether or not you can sort out what's going on so that you can do what you want to do versus whatever the app developer wanted you to do. Okay, so how do you do this? After all of this, how do you build a more secure medical app? And there's a stack of different features and buzzwords on the right um, that are important. So the first thing, as I mentioned earlier about jailbreaking and rooting devices, is the built-in mechanisms are not enough. They assume that they will never be broken and that everyone is an excellent coder and they're just not sufficient for applications that have a necessary protection amount. Secure app design practices, really, really important. For those of us that live in this space, you have to start with a good app design and then you have to imagine your security posture. I even like to play the game of what's the worst that can happen and then try to remediate against that. Um, there are, as a software company, there, there are deficiencies in depending on hardware only, even things like TEEs. Sometimes there's bugs found in those. And sometimes if you only write for those devices, 
then that means you can't run on other devices. And so you need to have the broadest coverage and that usually means software. Um, some of the secure app design practices are kind of the basics. Don't store critical information on the device unless necessary. Make sure that the data the app receives is subject to input validation. And you don't just trust everything and you validate it and verify it. Always use strong encryption and most importantly, use them correctly. Crypto is not a really easy thing to do poorly and a really hard thing to do well. And if you have to store passwords, you should only do it when protected by strong encryption, potentially with white box. These are the app protection technologies you can use to close the gap and mitigate those 83% of high severity threats. Um, on the right, you can see if the application is the entire item. There's all sorts of ways. Think of each of these as an entry point that a hacker can take to try to figure something out and do what he wants versus what you want. But the white box protected crypto, uh, we're gonna talk about here uh, in two slides, as well as putting in in-app protections, defensive uh, tamper resistance uh, technology so that your application either works 100% the way you designed it, or it doesn't work at all, or it phones home and says, I'm being hacked, I'm not gonna work anymore. Um, it, it basically can make a cry for help and then um, you know, behave the way you want it versus something unexpected. Okay, so we have two primary, and I'm gonna talk through the two applications and then we're gonna get to Q&A. Um, Dave, if you have things that you wanna jump in uh, on, please feel free. But this is the, um, this is our code protection tool. This is a developer tool that lives in your development environment that's used by your developers prior to the compiler. We obfuscate source code. So the actual code earlier we we're talking about, one of the poll answers was legacy code. How do I put protection on old code that was never designed? Well, if you have the source code, you've got a lot of options. If you don't have the source code, fewer, and that's just one of those cases where it's tough. Legacy code is hard. But if you do have the source code, there's a number of things we can work with you on. In particular, in the Java space, there's a lot of Java code out there, and a lot of it's not particularly well written or secure. There's some things that we can do there. But this does obfuscation, meaning it's hard to understand. Runtime checks, meaning if you fiddle with the code, we'll be aware of it, and we won't allow execution. We also have what we call tuning. So this is not a one size fits all, slap the button and you get a secure application. This is where you can tune your application to get that balance of security, performance and size. Because those are kind of the three legs of the stool as we try to put this together. This does not have a large impact on your development time. It's a straightforward process to implement our tool into your build train. And it does, it is cross-platform. This is for mobile desktop, server, and cloud, as well as embedded systems. If you have the source code written in native languages, C, C++, Objective-C, Swift, all the things that people write security-based code in, we can help you protect that. And the benefits there, you have a protected binary that can be resistant to attack in a zero trust environment. So code obfuscation, secure apps, is the application itself. The keys to the kingdom is secure key box. It's those keys that are inside the application that do the incredibly valuable things. It is of the utmost important to protect those keys at rest, runtime, in transit, basically everywhere, especially in a jailbroken environment when the hacker is right next to you, digitally speaking, watching what's going on. The ability to protect those keys is amazing. And it's, it's, it's a bit magical. I'm, I don't understand enough about white box to understand all the math that goes into it, but there's really something else to be able to have that level of confidence and yet be able to implement this solution that protects you. This solution is, uh, we constantly, as Dave said, we do the red team and the blue team, we attack it and we defend against it. It gets tested by independent uh, bodies as well as our customers often pen test it. We would be happy to put our white box, as we would say, up against anyone out in the world. Um, we feel that strongly about it. Uh, we we can talk at length about this. Uh, we'll we'll kind of leave it at that. Dave, did you want to add something in addition to how SKB works and how it's best implemented uh, in this sort of space? Yeah, I actually want to uh, talk about implement using both uh, SKB and obfuscation. Um, 
the obfuscation uh, part, the, the code protection, um, uh, the main point there is, is that hackers, they feed on bugs. And if they can't find the bugs because they can't analyze the code, then they're uh, not going to be able to uh, uh, nearly as easily uh, uh, attack the part of the system that you're protecting. Uh, even in the case where you're using hardware encryption, um, the way that the programmer uses the interface, just to say with a, a, a trusted execution environment, the TDE, um, that often is filled with bugs as well. And in fact, uh, sometimes there is a bug in the API, the TEE API. If, again, the attacker can't see that because your code is obfuscating, uh, obfuscated, then uh, you're less likely to see uh, uh, a successful attack. And in fact, we, we do monitor uh, 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 hacker organizations and get commentary from hackers and it's always satisfying to hear a hacker say, uh, say uh, in this version of the code, I can't make head nor tail of this. Uh, and they give up. So it's great to be able to see that, um, despite the fact that were, the designer uh, is using very, very good uh, uh, um, TEEs, very, very good hardware. Um, what you're doing is just discouraging the attackers and discouraging attackers is always a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so as we look forward and I see that we're approaching the end of our time, I wanna leave plenty of time for questions. So as we look forward, I sort of see the space as I did on the start of the call, of course, we're gonna have gr growing digital adoption. Um, the world is not gonna slow down in terms of digital M health applications. Question is, how do we come together as a, as a environment, as a group, as vendors that work with customers that deal with patients to protect us all and be on this journey together? Now, some of that is just the technology and some of that is um, working together. But since it's not just about data, it's not just about, um, you know, can I break an application? It's this is affecting people's lives and these apps are going to become even more important. Again, I, if we did this a year ago, I would say, well, these are things, these are important, but COVID has changed the world. And as, a, as an example of the level of importance that we now place on certain things, these attacks can have real consequences that those of us that are in this space will work together to make sure we're as protected as possible. And as the world changes going forward, our tools will continue to evolve with it as it has for the last 12 years with this tool set and the last 30 years with Intertrust. So that's that's the last of my slides. Um, it's It's been really, unfortunately, I can't see all of you. I, I, I've really enjoyed having this conversation. Um, Dave and I talk about this all the time, but were there any particular questions that came up? I'm not able to see that interface, but uh, Mitch, is there something you can um, do on this point? Yeah. yeah, I definitely got some great questions from our audience and thank you for submitting those. So feel free to, to pop in some more questions. Um, so that you said that most, this first question, most question, most apps have cryptographic issues. Are those real problems or the theoretical? Maybe you can provide some type, some real world scenarios that you're you're familiar with. You'd be able to share with the example. It kind of gives an idea of the problem space here. Some examples. Yeah. Um, well, I can't mention any specifics. I'm trying to think how people do crypto bad. It's a lot of times they either pick the wrong algorithm or cipher, or they do an in, inappropriate key length. Um, also, there's enough of a, so a key is a key, right? If you, even if you transform it in a different space, if you ever show that key in plain, that's where the hacker will grab it. You know, that's the very precise attack vector where they'll grab it. So we often talk with customers that did it their own way or did it in a different way. And they say, well, we see we got exploited here. And we say, well, one of those keys is to never have the key be in plain, ever. Like it, it just doesn't exist, which can sound a little magical. That's one of those things that we can talk about potentially after after the fact. Um, but white box definitely helps with that. It's it's, yeah, um, it's a deep talk. 
Uh, uh, Andrew, maybe I can give an example. It was a pretty profound one. I was working on a project uh, several years ago, an electronic cash in this case, and uh, uh, it was a, a, a smart card product that uh, had what was called a purse, which could disperse a certain amount of cash if you give cash to your kids, to other people, etc. And uh, the cash was actually stored on the card, uh, but cryptographically protected. And uh, we decided to uh, uh, have the security of the card uh, tested uh, by a, a very famous hacker that I know of. And so we sent the card to him. And um, a few days later, he sent the card back along with the key that was used to uh, control uh, what was happening on, on the card as well as to sign uh, the transactions. And the way he did it was actually using uh, a, um, uh, a side channel attack, such as what I described on uh, the processing uh, of the, the key so that he was able to monitor, uh, didn't even have to destroy or even you know, get into the, the processor. He just had to monitor how much power the, uh, the uh, device was using, in this case, the smart card, and he could see on, on a, an oscilloscope an image of the key. Uh, he wrote it down, sent it back to the CEO of the company that was pushing the product, and uh, they were astounded. Uh, and that can happen, and it has happened in, 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 other, uh, in other cases. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of people work on both uh, uh, launching and defending things like these side channel attacks that protect, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that attack cryptographic algorithms. It's definitely, uh, especially uh, getting access to the private key that gives away the whole keys to the kingdom per se. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's look at our uh, next question here. So we use uh, AWS Secure Cloud Services for storing patient data. Does that take care of our basic data protection requirements? Maybe what does it cover, what doesn't it cover? Any thoughts on that, gentlemen? Uh, well, uh, let me give uh, again a thought from the 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 system's point of view is is that uh, AWS is, uh, has a lot of really good uh, security tools in it. Uh, I could say that I'm aware of a few highly sophisticated attacks that would require some difficulty to launch, but in general, I think AWS is, uh, if you use the security tools, uh, is very good. On the other hand, um, it's part of typically part of a system, and it's typically part of a system that involves the use of uh, people to access the, the uh, data that's on uh, an AWS hosted service. Uh, and um, the, those, uh, those uh, clients uh, may hold the credentials, for example, to get access to various levels of, uh, of uh, interaction with your implementation on AWS. It may be the containers that you're using, um, you're allowed to get into or replace the containers, or perhaps it may be one of the, uh, one of the apps itself where you can change the configuration, you can get root privileges, et cetera. And it's all because of an inadequacy in the device that you're using, perhaps a, a mobile phone, uh, to present the credentials that allows you to get inside that. So you got to look at it from the system point of view. Well, and, and I'll even sort of branch that in a different direction. So if the question is, should I trust the AWS security tools? Maybe the answer is yes, maybe the answer is no. But part of that question is, should I trust AWS to own the root key to my security? And so it, there are certain organizations that don't want to trust Amazon, Microsoft, and Google with owning the the one key to rule them all, like that key is keys to the kingdom. Some companies, particularly those that are doing, and this is we're kind of jumping out of scope a little bit, but that are doing um, cloud-based key management systems that tie into mobile endpoints for delivering secure data down to the edge, um, don't want to trust the big tech providers with those root keys. And so they've architected their own solution. The reason we bring this up is that SKB as a software-based white box can be a component of that so that again, you never have this key in clear. That is some of the, some of the amazing aspects of white box is that the key 
doesn't exist, can't be lifted, can't be exploited. Now, there's a lot of texture behind what those words mean, but it is a very effective way to be able to use keys and algorithms and ciphers and not have them be exploitable. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, very good, very good. Let's um, jump to our next question. There was a question about one of your earlier slides. It might have been the one right before the the first poll that we did. They're asking um, how this kind of the data, where it came from, if it was from CISA uh, that you're referring to on one of the slides. I don't know if there was some, if you have an idea of can share of what the source of yeah. information was from. Do you recall which I one that might have been, Andrew? Yeah, I recall the slide. Uh, all the all that data is both held within our report. I know we work with a research organization. Um, if it sounds like since that person raised their hand, we can get a specific answer to you on that. Um, I know that the report itself has uh, essentially end notes of where all this came from. Um, I don't recall if it was uh, CISA specific. Uh, certainly, a new federal organization that has a lot of uh, weight from Department of Homeland Security for the security of this sort of information. Um, okay, it, good. We'll see if we can find where that might come from. Um, also, uh, Harish was asking about any insights on data, or excuse me, API related vulnerabilities uh, for connected devices, about API security, that topic. Dave, what do you think? I'm, I don't focus a lot on API security other than of course, transmitting data over the pipe. What's your thought? Uh, well, uh, again, uh, the um, APIs are uh, very often uh, uh, designed um, to accommodate a, a number of different functions. Some of them are things like uh, 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 update of a part of a system. In other cases, they're uh, to access a, a relatively secure, what you hope to be a relatively secure part of the system, uh, such as a TEE, et cetera. And APIs themselves, again, have their, um, uh, have bugs in them. As simple as some of them are, uh, they, they do have them. An example in the case of a TEE, uh, one of the things uh, programmers have to do is set a, a mode bit, for example, uh, to go into secure mode. And uh, it's a fairly straightforward thing that you would think that you know, you'd, you would always do. But on the other hand, uh, when you're uh, mucking around with code or you're at several levels above the code, sometimes you're not aware that you're not setting that bit. So um, making sure that people can't see how you're using an API very often is a, is a, a good part of your overall strategy. That is a really good point, Dave. I was going to say something kind of similar, which is uh, it's not just getting into the middle of the API session conversation, is if you can figure out how the API, or how the session is set up. Like sometimes credentials are in scripts and things like that that make it kind of give, give things away pretty easily for people to break into it. So considerations there. How about um, can, can the, these tools, I believe they're talking about the tools you're discussing today. Uh, from your company, can these tools be used on older software or only on newer software? So maybe just in general, what are some of the fundamental underlying requirements you need? So, since we're generally newer software or software you have source code for. So the reason is that since we are injected like yeast into dough into the source code, we don't we don't apply ourselves around the outside of a binary. We're injected into it before the compiler. So at least in terms of place, we're fairly far left in the development cycle. Um, if you have source code, we can work with you. There can be some remediation of what you can do like old Java desktop applications. We actually have a great solution for that. Um, and as a general jump off point on this comment is, what do you do from here is, of course we have a free trial. Of course we'd love to work with you. A lot of times what we do first is a, essentially a tire kicking call where your security posture is sort of lined up against what we offer, and we talk through how we might be able to help. Um, and then we walk you through a, a trial where the support team that manages that trial is actually the developers that have created it. So we have a very technical organization that has seen a lot and has a lot of experience. And to the extent that we may have piqued your interest today, we definitely would like to talk with you to see whether or not there's either a direct fit or there's 
something that we can work on to aid you as you try to close these gaps um, in your applications uh, as we move forward in, in this space. Well, good. We're almost at the top of the hour. I want to respect people's time, let them get to their next Zoom call, probably what they're doing next. Um, I want to thank both of you, Andrew and Dave, for fantastic uh, presentation discussion topics on the, on the topic of security and, and uh, mobile devices and, and medical devices. So I uh, also wanted to uh, let folks know about our winners of our gift card before we wrap things up. Our four winners are Andres S. Brent D, Shelby G, and Ted K. The folks at Security Boulevard will be reaching out to you about getting a hold of those. Also, just a reminder, we're sending an email with a link to the recording from the webinar today along with the slides. Be sure to check out, um, while we have a few minutes left, uh, the handout that's also with the webinar. I think we'll have a way of getting that uh, to you as well on, on mobile yeah. device, medical device security. So I keep interchanging those two words. Uh, I wanna thank both of you, David, uh, Mayor, CTO EBP with Intertrust Technologies, and Andrew Snyder, Technical Solution Director. Uh, super knowledgeable, great information, I'm sure is very helpful to folks today. We'd like to also thank you, our audience. You know, an hour of your time is extremely valuable. We're all working more hours. We're working harder during the time of COVID, and the fact that you spend an hour with us, we're very honored, and we hope we've used this time well. So we wish you all the best. Have a great day. Be safe. Be well out there. Thank you. Okay.